Hello there, I'm Gloria Makarenko. Well, today we get a glimpse of beauty drawn by a world explorer and a little taste of the city's Christmas tradition. This is Our Vancouver. Coming up, channel your inner Clark Griswold to bring home that perfect Christmas tree. We'll show you it's much simpler than that. And carrying on a gone but not forgotten Vancouver Christmas tradition. But first, meet an artist whose world travels sparked a lifelong passion and friendship. A Vancouver-based artist says that he tries to be a steward of beauty in everything he makes. And his stunning drawings, they borrow ideas from a bygone era. So think James Audubon meets Robinson Crusoe. That's right, Charles Van Sandwick's works. They are a delight to see and a delight to read. And we are delighted that Charles is with us here today. Charles, hello and welcome. Thank you, Gloria. It's lovely to be here. You are just taking us somewhere else with all these beautiful works. But uh, why don't we talk about uh, a new start for your, for your shop? We opened my uh, business partner, uh, Waisiki Doughty, and I opened a little gallery, bo bookshop gallery in Gastown. Uh, and we've just uh, had a little Christmas launch, uh, so we, uh, we're very excited. We're in an old building, 1890, which is almost as old as I am. And uh, uh, we, we loved it. We've uh, restored the inside to look old fashion, which suits my work, I think. And uh, uh, it's just very exciting. I mean, people tell you about the pitfalls and nightmares of retail, which are true, by the way but nobody told us how much fun it was going to be. It's really great to meet people and uh, see people's reaction firsthand. Okay, to reaction to, well, how could you not <laughs> react to some of these beautiful works? Just tell us the, the ideas of how you got onto this particular style in, in, in terms of representing images that, that seem like they're from our past. Well, I, when I was younger, I, I painted uh, quite realistically, uh, mostly animals and birds. I grew up in South Africa, and my parents always had those old prints that you mentioned, like Audubon, on the wall, and they always spoke to me. Uh, they seemed to be a timeless reminder of, of captivating beauty and keeping it still. Then I got a little older and settled in Fiji when I, when I was 19, and uh, my Fijian friends are great storytellers and avid listeners, and they encouraged me to tell them stories, because in those days we had no TV or, there was radio, or we'd listen to uh, morning radio serials that were done in Australia in the 50s. And, uh, and so I sort of honed my skills uh, as a storyteller as well. And, and that's the fun of it. You know, I moved from painting purely for, for, for the wall to creating books, which really is like having a gallery in your hand, you know, and it's a, it's a quiet way to communicate with people on the other side of the world and across generations as well. Tell me more about the impact that Fiji had on on the way you see the world and the way you reflect the world? Well, you know, I'm not the only one to tell you that Fijians are probably the nicest people on the planet. You know, they, they are slow to anger, quick to laugh, and they revere human kindness above anything else. So that was pretty brilliant for a young man to encounter a, a culture that revered forgiveness, revered apology. Um, everything was taken to a, you know, a, a, sort of a decent human level. And that really suited the work I was doing too. I lived in a little thatched hut for 10 years that Waisiki's father and uncles built for me. And uh, it was there I was able to hone my skills and absorb the, 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 the graciousness of the people around me with the, in, the incredible beauty, uh, the landscape. It's uh, intoxicating, you know? And, 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 you know, go to bed each night in a little thatched hut. It was. The, the idea of going away from the world like Robinson Crusoe so, so you could do an inward journey and then end up painting landscapes of the mind rather than purely what's out there. And so dreams became very important to me and I do a lot of work from my dreams. Uh, that's how you'll see things that sort of don't look quite so real 
Well, you mentioned Waisiki is your business partner, but yes. he's also got a major influence on your work. And uh, you don't only illustrate. T tell us about this special little book. Well, uh, this is uh, an unexpected gift. And, and Waisiki's sister, Lucy, who I used to tell them stories when they were kids, she said, Tully, tell me a Christmas story. And I didn't have anything on the shelf. And she said, make something up. I said, well, what would you like to hear? She said, well, I want to see Father Christmas, a polar bear, um, and at least one reindeer. The rest is up to you. <laughs> uh, oh, God, here we go. Pressure's so, on. Yeah, so it sent me scurrying for paper, and I wrote a list of what I, like a menu of how the story might go. Uh, I, and uh, there, there's, there's the North I Pole. I know, I just, and I, again, <laughs> I can't do justice to all these beautiful works. that's Father works. Christmas. Of course, yeah. that's Father Christmas. And this is his cousin, <laughs> Bartholomew the Green, who lives at the South Pole. And his water sled is pulled with penguins. Oh, I see. Isn't and that magical? The gist of the story is that reindeer teach the penguins how to fly. Well, of course they do. Which is not of preposterous at do. all. Can you just take us through some of some of these other special sure. editions that you have here in front of this this big one here? All right, that was a deluxe edition that I illustrated for the Folio Society in London in 2016 to commemorate the 150th anniversary of Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland. Yes. Okay, and what else have you brought in? Well, I have here Canadian Content that was written by both Waisiki and myself. We're both lads from other lands. Mm -hmm. We we're very grateful that Canada accepted us. And so oh, I wrote a poem about Canada. Uh, Waisiki was playing rugby in those days and dragged me all across the Western Canada. <laughs> and But I got to see the majesty of what this country is really built on. You know, it really is a, I mean, you've got to fall in love with a country who has the presence of mind to grow Christmas trees. <laughs> there you, you know? go. Think there about you it, go. you know? And how do the customers respond when they step into your store and really do step back in time in many ways? Mostly they think I'm dead. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> well, we had a young lady come in a few weeks ago and she said, oh my goodness, did you have permission from the artist's grandchildren to open this? And I said, yes. And she said, oh, you must be his biggest fan. I thought, okay, I have to tell her the truth. So, <laughs> it's me. Yeah, yeah. And, I, so she, and she burst into tears because she had had one of my books since she was a baby. So to her, this was some dim, distant figure from a long time ago. But I bought her a hamburger and she stopped crying. It was fine. <laughs> that always works. Yeah, that's That right. always works. Now, Charles, we don't have the time to do justice to all of these beautiful books and these beautiful images that you brought in today. But for people who would like to come in and experience it in yeah. person, where do they go? We're at 315 Camby Street in Gastown, more or less the corner of Camby at Cordova, across from the Camby Street Hotel. Well, you said that Canada was uh, good to accept you. I think yes. we're very lucky to have you and Wasiki uh, here, so, here. So thank you so much for coming in today. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas, and you're too kind, Gloria. Thank you so much. This is our Vancouver. Okay, by now you've probably started your gift buying, we hope. But what about the Christmas tree? Now, if a plastic or store-bought tree won't do, consider harvesting your own. Here's how you do it. So it's the holidays, and what better way to get into a merry mood than to cut down your own Christmas tree? Well, to do it legally, the first thing you should know is there's some red tape, and not the festive kind. You need to register for a permit on the BC government's website. It's quick, easy, and free. Print off the paperwork, and the adventure begins. Before you take off on your Christmas adventure, make sure you have your tree cutting permit with you at all times. Some other useful items, a first aid kit, some rope, and the right tool for the job. In BC, you can't just chop down a tree anywhere. Odds are you'll have to go on a bit of a trek. Trusty online maps from the province show you exactly where you can cut, depending on which region you live. For us, that meant a trip up the Sea to Sky Highway north of Vancouver. Let's go. 
be prepared for a hike in. We're here just outside of Squamish. This is the closest place you can come to if you live in Metro Vancouver to cut down your own tree. And if you do have a permit, you'll have to do it underneath power lines. That's because these areas are regularly cleared. Head to high ground to get a good view of what's in the area. And don't be afraid to size up any potential candidates. Before you start cutting, make sure you find the perfect tree for you. I like this one. Make sure it fits right on top of your car, and when you start cutting, make sure you do it right at the base. Nothing to it. Now, a lot of people might come out here with the preconceived idea that the trees out here are full and picturesque like you'd see in the movies, when in fact, a lot of them are actually quite sparse, but they're still beautiful because you cut it down yourself. <laughs> Safely secure the tree to the roof of your car or even squeeze it inside if you can, then you're ready to hit the road. Steady as a rock. Well, she's all loaded up. Now it's time to head home, bust out the decorations, and sip some eggnog. John Hernandez, CBC News, Squamish. All right, time for one of our favorite features. This is where we get to showcase some of the photographs that you send in. Thanks, first of all, to Rick Mackey for sending in this dazzling nighttime shot of Creekside. The city lights never looked better. Thank you. Todd Williams says he was heading to work when he was inspired by this frozen wonderland in Langley. Cold, but oh, isn't that gorgeous? And finally, a young Cooper's hawk turning heads in rush hour traffic at Canby and 8th. Morris Saldov says the bird stuck around just long enough to get a close up. And do send us more if you're out with your cameras. Choose some of your favorite photographs and email them to us, bcphotos at cbc.ca. That's bcphotos at cbc.ca. Well, it looks like some trouble for some of Canada's wild things. A new report from UBC on our country's biodiversity warns that thousands of species are at high risk of being wiped out. And the biggest blow could be to some of our smallest creatures. It's just not in Canada anymore. In little boxes and in little envelopes. On Haida Gwaii, we had a rare species. Are samples of the most threatened creatures in the country. It's just found on this one cliff face. Yeah. Scientists at UBC's Biodiversity Museum have catalogued around 2 million specimens, including many of the 80,000 species found in Canada. A new report says many of them are under threat. Extinction is a very chilling word. Once something is gone, it is gone forever. Every five years, Canada tries to add to its catalog of species and see how they're doing. Researchers don't have enough information about many, but those they do know about, the news isn't good. One in five species are at risk of extinction in Canada, which points to the urgent need for action. And while larger animals like whales or marmots garner the most attention, the vast majority of species threatened are either insects, plants, mosses and lichen. So they're disproportionately affected by human activities uh, based on what we're seeing in this report. Biologist Toby Sprobilla specializes in lichen. There are um, uh, flying squirrels, uh, which uh, use it for um, nesting material, and uh, a lot of birds. If you've ever seen a hummingbird nest, hummingbirds use it for nesting material, and it's very, very well integrated into uh, the ecosystem. A point scientists at UBC hope their museum can help people understand. We don't really have enough understanding to say, well, we can afford to lose 5%, 10%, 15%. At some point, the whole system collapses, and we don't know enough to even know where that point is. The federal government has committed to protecting 30% of Canada's lands and oceans by the next decade. They're halfway there right now. But scientists are worried by then, more species in Canada will only be found in museums like this. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. You know, we're happy to say it's not all bad news for animals in the wild. Scientists studying whales in BC tell us that the northern resident orcas are doing quite well. Here's why. My name is Jared Towers. I live here in Alert Bay, home of the killer whale, and 
I, uh, I do a number of things in regards to killer whale research, both here and in many other places around the world. I grew up on the water with killer whales every day of, of every summer since I was six years old. And that was because my family owned a whale watching company here, one of the first whale watching companies in Canada. Working with killer whales is, is really all I've known. Northern and Southern residents are, are actually very similar in a lot of ways. They, they fill a, a similar ecological niche. One of the big differences is that the, the range of Southern residents living where they do, they overlap a lot more with human activities for the most part. And all the associated activity, um, shipping and uh, all the uh, associated impacts of that. And so Southern residents are, are faced with a lot more threats within their range. Northern residents, on the other hand, um, live in a, a more pristine environment. It's worth mentioning that none of these populations intermingle at all. You know, they've been uh, genetically distinct for for generations and generations. That said, they, they do compete for some of the same resources. They both feed on Chinook salmon. Uh, they both prefer and um, probably only eat fish and, and large fish. A lot of the salmon that, that come down the coast and are returning to, to spawn, it may be that northern resident killer whales have first access to those fish as they work their way down the coast. I think we can be optimistic about the northern residents. Their, their population size is bigger than it, it ever has been before. Um, when studies on the population abundance were begun in the early 70s, uh, the population was one third the size it is now. So this population has been growing at uh, an average of about 2.2% per year for uh, the last uh, 40 some odd years. And the Southern residents more or less uh, just staying staying the same. It's pretty special for some of us who, who you know, get woken up in the middle of the night by killer whales passing our houses or um, get to know different families and individuals um, over the years and, and watch them make use of their own traditional territories and, and bring their families back to these areas. And I think that, you know, it goes to show that these parts of the coast are are and are important to these whales and have been um, and will continue to be for generations so long as they can make a living here. Coming up, new information about how climate change affects Antarctica. And it's coming to us from a vessel called Bodie McBoatface. We have a lot of questions when it comes to climate change and Antarctica. Now, on the one hand, this giant landmass is surrounded by a lot of floating sea ice, and that ice is shrinking, adding to sea level rise. But Antarctica is complicated. From space, the landmass appears to be growing because of changes in weather patterns. Underneath the continent, though, it is widely known that warm currents are eating away from underneath, in part leading to the great Calvin events that we're seeing more and more of. And we've just had our first piece of real evidence of one of these warm currents, all thanks to a submarine named Bodie McBoatface. No, really. Back in 2016, United Kingdom's Natural Environment Research Council asked the public to name their $200 million polar research vessel. Naturally, the public proposed and voted on Bodie McBoatface. So the UK government was like, uh, we're going to go ahead and call our $200 million ship the Sir David Attenborough, also a great name, but we'll call the autonomous underwater submarine that will live on board Bodie McBoatface. So since 2017, the Sir David Attenborough and Bodie have been exploring the water underneath Antarctica's ice shelves. Now, the Filchner Rhone Ice Shelf is the largest floating extension of the Antarctic ice sheet by volume. The ocean beneath it is cold and dense, and so there's little ocean driven melting. But climate models predict that we'll see a big shift in ocean circulation. And in the coming century, we might actually see large scale inflows of warm water, which may mean significant consequences for global sea level rise. And now we are getting the first observations of the inflow of warm water to this region from Bodie McBee. Bodie's data shows us that warm water is coming in and out underneath the ice shelf. Now, Bodie McBoatface will continue its research and more data is needed, but stay tuned because Bodie McBee is going to do great things for understanding of climate change. 
And now, you're science smart. If you have a science question on your mind, send me an email, and I'll try to get it answered. Johanna, thank you. While you are watching Our Vancouver, I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, the seasonal treats that we eat often connect us to tradition. Maybe it's that special panettone or levkuchen that you can't wait to have every year. But for a lot of people here in Vancouver, it is the celebrated Four Seasons Stolen. So if you're wondering what happened to the recipe after the hotel closed, we're going to answer that question with you today. Chef Mark Burton has kept the tradition alive. Mark, welcome. Awesome. Thank you very much for having me. What is the story behind this celebrated stolen? Well, the, uh, the stolen when I joined on at the Four Seasons was being made by a, a gentleman by the name of Gerhard Wetzel. And uh, it was this huge tradition, probably at least I know it of being 42 years old. Um, it was something that he actually came out of retirement, or he actually wouldn't retire. Mm -hmm. uh, he kept back, coming back every Christmas to make this stolen. It was magical for him, the customers, the people in the bakery. Um, it, it just became this tradition, a real kind of tradition that I, I thought needed to stay alive. Okay, and how would you define stolen as opposed to differentiating it from fruitcake? Um, stolen, major difference is stolen is actually a bread. So stolen is much less sweet, doesn't have quite as much fruit and nuts in it. Um, but it is still rich, it is still heavy, it is still enjoyed at Christmas time. Um, but it shouldn't really be confused with fruitcake. Um, but there's, there's many different types out there that can, some be a little bit more fruitcakey, some are a little bit breadier. Um, a lot of a lot of variety okay. when it comes well, to stolen. And you brought some I, different varieties with us uh, for our show today. So what have you brought? So um, this is I've got um, this is the particular stolen that uh, I make, and this is actually the the variation on the Four Seasons recipe. Um, and then I've got a couple other stolens, different styles of stolens that um, are, are made throughout the city by various bakeries, um, just to kind of see the difference between the breads and how they can actually be made. Okay, so let's start with yours. So this is um, again this is the the, the stolen. We're very very similar. To the stolen that has been made from the Four Seasons. They are baked originally, um, and these are some of the wooden frames that were actually baked in. I rescued these Wait from the Four second. Seasons. Wait a second, you can put the wood in the oven? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. and then uh, these were some frames that a friend of mine actually reproduced for me to try to replicate these. So these frames are potentially like 40, 50 years old. These these ones I know, that I that I know of are about 42 years old. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Okay. These are I only two. Okay. <laughs> and what, what do you have in yours? You've got, there's a marzipan in the middle. Yeah, big, healthy, generous bit. portion of marzipan, uh, golden raisins, almonds, and then of course a little bit of citrus fruit. Mm. Oh, that is gorgeous. But I see where you get that, that it's not full on fruit cake, which is sort Abs of absolutely, soaked yeah. in alcohol or something? Yeah, do you put lasts for two in years. Pardon me? Do you put some alcohol in uh, yours? The raisins are conditioned or soaked in uh, <laughs> rum, of course. Okay, I've got it. And what about this one here? So this is a, um, this is actually kind of mirrors a very particular type of stolen that is probably the most common stolen that you'll find in Vancouver, which is um, mirroring, uh, it's called, I'm going to try to say this, Dresden Stolen, mm -hmm. which is made in a uh, a town in Germany right. that is very well known and is like actually a protected type of food. Okay. This is a little bit breadier, marzipan's a little bit less, different type of fruit, um, texture's a little bit different. Lovely, and okay. what about this last one? And then this one here is, um, this is kind of, uh, I would say this is almost uh, an, a recreated version of that where it's got a different flavor profile, different mix of spices have gone into this. Marzipan is similar again, but you can see that even the finishing of some can, of them is a little I'm bit getting, different. I'm, I'm getting a little bit of that. Help yourself. It's more cinnamony. You're right, there's definitely yeah. definitely different types of different types of spices in that. Yeah, and you can see that I've got a variety of spices mm. that are used, particularly in the one that I make. Um, nutmeg, cardamom, cinnamon, vanilla, cloves, Okay, if somebody wanted to tackle something like, like this at home, how difficult is it? You, you absolutely have to start out with a mold like this? Um, it depends. This this particular type of stolen is actually called butter stolen. So mm -hmm. it does contain quite a bit of butter, and I think that's, you know, really what kind of I makes think it. at Christmas time, it, there's no limit. Of course, no you, limit. you're waiting all year. Uh, you can have <laughs> a little bit, a lot. I mean, um, it's up to you. Um, this one, the dough was very, very soft. So it is a bread dough, not unlike a, a brioche dough. So it does require a frame. You can even bake this in a loaf pan if okay. you wanted to try to make one at home. These particular two are actually shaped like bread and they can be baked without a mold. 
Okay, let's talk about, I mean, we talked about the 42-year tradition from Gerhardt, but what about for you now? What kind of demand is there for, for your stolen this year? Um, I think because it, um, it, it is kind of a carry-on of that tradition, there was an incredible uh, demand for this particular, the loyal fans from the Four yep. Seasons. Um, I got Gerhardt's blessing to actually make this, um, to recreate this stolen and carry-on tradition. Um, I also teach at Vancouver Community College, and the main uh, purpose behind this was to really kind of pass along this tradition, the importance of this type of stuff for the future uh, right. speakers. But so, do, do you have a team? Do you do this on your own? I am 100% solo operation. My wife was helping me. She's now gone back to work. Um, so I'm the receiver. I'm the food store, the baker, the chef, the delivery guy, <laughs> the accountant. Uh, one man show. How many stolen do you make in the season? A, last year, I made pretty close to 3,000. So... <laughs> That's great. So your life is all about stolen. Uh, for the month, uh, m pretty much the entire month of December, yeah, that's it. It's <laughs> crazy. What do you do for the rest of the year? Um, I, do I teach? You teach. Or I, and I try to relax a little bit, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy. No, okay. I love it. Would you take this kind of thing to, to a storefront or to a commissary in the future? I think there's a possibility of it, absolutely. Um, it's something to kind of gravitate towards. I mean, obviously the, the demand is there. People are just, you know, basically pound down the door trying to get um, some of this stolen. Uh, and every bakery across the city is the same way. Everybody loves stolen. Yeah, I, and what about shelf life for stolen? Like you're saying, most, it's gotta be December. You couldn't start in, in, Ju in June or July for something like this. No, most stolen are, um, because of the nature of the way that they're made, the fermentation, the soaked fruit, and the actual marzipan, a lot of them will actually stay good for an extended period of time, up to three months. Okay. Um, as long as they're wrapped very well and stored in a cool, dark place like your refrigerator, and they freeze for up to a year. There's no way this is going to last three months in my house. <laughs> I've, I've already <laughs> gone through no two of my own. So, <laughs> You've done yeah. it. Do you eat a lot more as you're baking? Um, not as I'm baking. I actually take the time, and I think it's really important, I take the time to enjoy it properly. I usually have a little coffee and a slice of stolen, um, usually like one a night, uh, well, one little slice I'm of gonna stolen. I'm going to go down the street, get a little bit of coffee, and uh, enjoy this at my leisure too. Thank you so much for coming in and happy holidays to you, Mark. Happy holidays to you, thank you for having me. Mm. That was really lovely. This is our Vancouver. If I'm ever gonna fall in love, I know it's gonna be you. Hey, if you wanna go and see some live music, check out a new rising music star. Singer-songwriter Ali Gady plays the Commodore Ballroom December 15th. So. And music legend Tom Cochran is set to rock the Pacific Coliseum December 16th. Hey, I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music with a very important update for you in our eighth annual Canadian Music Class Challenge that's happening right now. That's when we challenge music teachers across the country to teach their kids a Canadian song and make a video of the performances for a chance to win great prizes. This year, thousands of students from coast to coast to coast rose to the challenge, and this week, we have released our national top tens in all the different age categories from kindergarten to grade 12. And here are just a few of the highlights from our finalists.
so adorable and very fantastic. Those are just a few of the music classes from across Canada that have made it into the top 10 finals of our 2022 Canadian Music Class Challenge in all the different age categories. You can check out the list of the finalists and check out all the videos for yourself at cbc.ca slash music class. And I'll be back to reveal the winners of this year's challenge soon. That's when you'll find out which classes win thousands of dollars worth of new musical instruments for their classrooms and framed plaques for the trophy case. I'm Grant Lawrence. Keep Canadian music education alive and I'll check in with you again soon. And congratulations to those finalists. Coming up, artists in a digital era carve out a living in a brave new metaverse. Hi, welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, it is art for a new digital age. Artists are exploring new ways to create and get paid for it, too. And in our latest Metaverse series, we're going to look at the opening up of a whole new era of creativity. I strongly believe that there's something to be said, kind of like the relationship that we have with one another, with our environment, with the universe. And to me, those are things that I cannot express freely with words, so I use visual language to express those things. Art is supposed to be a language, so if somebody's connected to, to my work, it's like we're having like a good conversation, basically. I think my work is like a mix of like digital surrealism, all my career, like my biggest goal was to be seen as an artist because the reality is like I'm not really good at commercial work, but I'm really good at executing what I like to execute and like putting my ideas out, out there. I had been working in traditional mediums, oil painting and drawing primarily, but I always dabbled with digital art, but I never pursued it seriously. It felt like the only way to have success as a digital artist was to either sell prints of your work, do commissions for brands, or to work in the film industry. And none of those options were appealing to me. But with NFTs, it kind of created an even playing field with the traditional art world where suddenly there's a way of monetizing the craft. Necessity of like having to work for somebody was like out of the picture. And our brands can now be focused on like, okay, now I have the resources and the time to focus completely on building what I always wanted to build for years and years, you know? I don't need to do anything for anybody. Like, I, I'm just doing me and people still support it, which is insane. Having proof of ownership, uh, digital transparency, having royalties embedded in the NFTs is really a game changer so that artists can continue making passive income beyond the initial sale. If I sell at one NFT, and it gets resold, I get a percentage, I get a royalty of each sales, which is the biggest game changer for musicians and artists and anyone. And you get paid during you, you sleep basically, because if someone trades your art during the sleep, you might get a small percentage of the art you did, which is pretty important. Before I entered the NFT space, I didn't know very much about crypto at all. I wasn't really interested in it but I was in it for the art. There was a, a bit of a learning curve, but now that I have that knowledge, it's I can't unsee it. So the first one was a one-on-one. -on -one. It, it's called Rejuvenate. That's my Genesis uh, NFT. And I, it was on Super Rare. Pretty crazy because like I minted it without any expectation. And like, I think for 18 hours, there was no activity. And I was like, oh, okay, at least I tried. Like it's Like, it's fine. At the end, there was a bid war. And it went to, I think it went to 15 ETH which at that time was like $5,000, $6,000. And it's crazy because a couple of years ago, I wouldn't be able to say that I love my art, but now it's so easy to say that I love what I'm doing and I love the art I'm putting out there. A NFT is, is uh, a medium that is very like suitable for people that care about their practice and they really work at it. They have patience to like build like a, a trajectory and like they have patience to, and like they love to 
build a community and make it sustainable. Most of us, if not all of us, we got into this because we love making art and we will continue to make art till the day that we physically can't. We've been in this space for a long time and like our goal is to build this into something like healthy, sustainable for everybody and like grow it and keep pushing it, right? A rare northern BC rainforest is going to be preserved for future generations thanks to the efforts of a community group in Prince George. Now, after learning that logging companies were eyeing the area, they proposed a simple trail and a path toward reconciliation. Just watch. About an hour away from Prince George, ancient trees untouched. This forest it has been here for two, three, maybe 10,000 years in developing before it became an ancient forest. And uh, it, was, it was scheduled to be logged. In 2005, volunteers built a pathway to draw visitors in to admire the rainforest, hoping to save it. We tried hard to protect this forest. We just wanted to, to make this area accessible for everybody. As people started to pay attention to the forest, Hello. so did the provincial government. And in 2016, the land was designated as a provincial park, conserving thousands of hectares of old growth. It's an ecosystem filled with wonders at every corner for this UNBC professor. It's a lichen with personality, and I think it's the cutest lichen that I know of here. We are still finding new species as we go out into the landscape here. In these temperate rainforests, uh, there are far more species growing above my head, growing epiphytic on the trees, than there are growing on the forest floor. Darwin is proud of the community for coming together to defend biodiversity. So in Prince George and McBride and Valemont, communities that are dependent on the forest industry and proud of that part of their heritage, they took ownership of these old forests and said, look, we, we think this ancient forest site is very important. But the protected area is only a small fraction of the rainforest. Members of the Clay Clitene First Nation say much more needs to be done to protect their lands. It is still a bit of a battleground and uh, we're trying to protect beyond the boundaries of the park because the boundaries of the park aren't enough to protect this unique ecosystem. Okay, so we're measuring the diameter of the cedar tree here. These massive trees are located outside of the protected area. 4.4 meters. The team has been measuring and mapping trees, hoping to add them to the park. I think we're now realizing that special places such as this are becoming increasingly rare. And if we want our children or our grandchildren, if we want future generations to experience them, We've only got a decade or so to, to ensure that they're still going to be here. Camille Vernet, Radio-Canada, Prince George. Coming up, how marking the past can hint at our future. The poetry of Iranian-Canadian Sara Farman. Hi, welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, a local poet writing stories of her family's past says that looking back has helped her have hope for the future. Sarah Farman's family was among the first wave of Iranian immigrants to come to Canada in 1979. And the CBC's Stephen Quinn spoke with Farman about her first book of poetry called Pistachios in My Pocket. Uh, in 2018, I started at the uh, SFU's TWS program, the mm -hmm. Writer's Studio, and that's where we were encouraged by my mentors, Betsy Warland and Yonina Curtin, to look back on our body of work and see what themes emerged. And I noticed that themes of belonging and loss and loss of homeland and displacement, but also resilience and hope were uh, not just peppered throughout my work, but were quite obviously what I was trying to write about. Right. So I decided to really delve in and um, 
give people an understanding of the Iranian thread within the large universal story of displacement and also uh, to share my own family's personal experiences. Right. It was very important for me to give that political framework uh, because I wanted uh, people to have an understanding. You know, in Canada, we're so lucky we have such a beautiful multicultural mm -hmm. country. And um, I do, at that time, I felt that a lot of us didn't know about what the circumstances were in Iran. The fact that, for example, my mother and my grandmother lived in a country that had the same status for women rights, for women, as that of North America, you know. And we fled, um, you know, they really didn't think that this would happen to them, but it did. And so our story is one of many of displaced people, you know. <laughs> I, I couldn't have imagined that this that yeah. my book would come out at the same time of the first female-led revolution in the history of the world of our time, you know? And um, the fact that my book, I feel that my book um, serves to inform and unify people behind the freedom fighters of Iran and also all displaced people. And uh, I feel that my book also situates Canada within what's yes. happening, right? But, but it's funny because when you look at some of the poems, there's Penny Royal Flower, mm -hmm. um, which begins, if I may, far inside the city, revolution rages, divisive voices, conflicting ideologies, fighting for freedom. Who's fighting and who's freedom? Yes. Yeah. That could be today. It could. And it, it, it even could be anywhere, right, in the well, world. Well, that's true. <laughs> like, I look at what's happening in the States right now. Yeah. Right? Um, yes, definitely. And I mean, what, it, really, what a shame that we lost our country, our freedom, to Islamic fundamentalism. And I really hope that the freedom fighters can gain it back. Um, every night I go to bed and I think, wouldn't it be wonderful if to be able to hop on a plane very soon and yeah. go celebrate freedom in Iran? <laughs> right now, that effort, though, is coming at a tremendous cost oh, and tremendous sacrifices. It really is. I can't, I mean, the bravery of the women supported by the men and children, it's its heart-wrenching. It's devastating um, for the diaspora. It, you know, we live and breathe it every day with them. Mm -hmm. We're in mourning, uh, but we also want to keep fighting. In the face of this regime, could it be successful? I believe it can. I really do. I believe that the world is watching. In fact, I was listening to CBC a few weeks ago and I heard um, silence is violence. You know, there's no longer silence. Yeah. And I also think back to how it started. Khomeini had audio tapes, like video, like remember recordings that came into the campuses and that's how they won this revolution. And I mean, now we've got social media, we've got Generation Z there. They're amazing. They're fighting. And we have the support of the diaspora. I encourage everybody, not just Iranians, but non-Iranians to discuss what they learn with their friends and family, share it on Facebook. And it doesn't have to be all doom and gloom. You know, it could right. be something as simple as, you know, that the Iran is part of the union, the UN's Human Rights Council. Why do you think that is? And do you think they should still be there? And do you know there's a petition? And maybe share the petition, share the letters. It's really interesting. We have a lot of activists and lawyers that are writing letters and they've got tiny mm -hmm. URL. You click on it, you can send a letter in support to elected officials in Canada, United Nations officials. These are all ways that we can help. And I, I, I have faith. I have faith. I really do. Got to be right. I, I, I mean, I think to myself, my mom, my father, my grandmother, they did not imagine that, like you said earlier, that their rights would be stripped away like that, you know? So if they couldn't imagine it, I think, you know what? We can imagine that it's all going to come back. What's your, um, what's your life been like since you got here? Oh, gosh. We've been, as much as the uncertainties that we faced, we've been very lucky. We mm -hmm. found um, Canada to be a welcoming bastion of uh, peace, safety, multi multiculturalism, multiculturalism, and we, and we thrived here. Um, I think a lot of the poems in my book mm -hmm. also reflect that, that it wasn't, you know, we were the first wave of Iranian immigrants, so we were really one of the first few handful of Iranians on the North Shore mm -hmm. in Vancouver. And, um, but, but we were surrounded by very welcoming people. Yeah. And yeah, I, I've lived a beautiful life here in Canada. I'm so grateful. And that's all for our Vancouver for this week. I hope you can join me weekday afternoons on CBC Radio 1 for On the Coast. Bye-bye for now.